it was always one of the most wild places, even in the past, in the 60s, there was no facilities. If somebody came down there and wanted to camp, they just found a tree. And if you went on one of those, those camps, one of the biggest concerns was, was being chased by a rhino. And if you went into the jet, you knew you were going to get uh, a chase, chased by a rhino at some point. So we were looking around for a tree to climb. I mean, it was absolutely unreal. You could, in one morning, you might come across 10 rhino. To capture rhino in the 19, late 1960s, it was all done on foot. There were no helicopters. Your initial tracking and darting would consist of probably four people. So that was more or less your tracking team that got you into position and, and did the actual darting. Once that happened, you called in the truck. They would then start to actually maneuver the rhino onto the sledge. They roll it on and then tie it down with ropes. So then everybody got back onto the truck and you headed for, for back to camp as quickly as you could and released it in the sort of reverse order, gave it the antidote and basically that was it. Obviously, I was born and raised here. Uh, I think I was introduced to the Saibulundi Junction at the age of three months. I have a picture of me sitting in the river there. Uh, it's, a, it's an area that's very dear to my heart, and uh, I've seen the ups and downs over the years, uh, specifically regarding rhino. Their population grew. Uh, at the time, I was an honorary officer for National Parks. I was very much involved. And uh, that population that, that was introduced in the early 70s by the mid 80s had more than doubled, almost trebled in population. It was, it was an amazing recruitment rate and was very encouraging. I was involved in setting up a tourism operation in the, in, in the early 80s and rhino were, were plentiful and we would follow We'd take runner walks and uh, it was, it became quite a, an attraction. The initial decline in animal numbers was in, was in sort of an insidious creep, but then right towards the end of my stay in the Gun Resort, so that was 86 and 87, there was a dramatic increase in the poaching of rhino that took place. And then we had what, what I would call poaching that had political links in that there was definitely evidence that poachers were coming down, were coming in uh, and rhino horn then being exported, being taken back to Arari and moving out in, uh, under diplomatic bag immunity status. We found evidence of five rhino that had been killed down in the junction area, literally within sight of one another, uh, which indicated that it was very, very experienced poachers that were uh, operating in that area, very skilled marksmen, uh, sophisticated weapons. So it was no longer the sort of 303 subsistence type uh, opportunistic uh, poaching that was taking place. When the Aranamo uh, uh, resistance moved along the, our eastern boundary and uh, uh, the law and order in that area broke down and uh, tragically um, over a period of about five years that population was completely removed. I figured in my first patrol in the base camp. It led to a big mass pora ma pocha. Lawa inga inga landa. I wanna go na na inga lai my elephants. I mahi ona ne awa hinda waka wana tinga kuto tala. But the agwe awa lechwa nga end. So the TV le guna ni wala wala was pender. Then logo wa chigle area le wata wata wana go. Then, 
Deni ito jinga da jita kebi chwa ji suwa mali lagu. Nga gu hivu gu in 94 hivu gu nga hela gu kumba saraka haya aspe mbele za chos. Black Rhino is a token of large landscapes. It's a token of connectivity. It's a token of a healthy ecosystem. So by bringing Rhino back into Gonzo, it's basically underlined and underpins our efforts over the last 14 years. There's a lot of misperception around an operation such as this. Uh, people see the operation itself as being the be all and end all of it. You know, where you've got helicopters in the air, vets loading darts and moving uh, runners around on trucks and stuff like that. Uh, that's so far from the truth, it's, it's, not, it's crazy. Uh, preparation for this translocation started in 2007. Uh, Frankfurt Zoological Society came in, uh, they started a conservation support partnership with, with Zim Parks um, and right from that time it was the stated intent to get to a position that, that rhinos could be reintroduced into Gondor Rejour. It's taken 14 years to create the conditions that are germane to, to uh, receive that population in a responsible fashion. line there. In Africa we've now lost more than 10,000 rhino in the last 10 years. So it's on a massive threat. Um, so reintroducing rhino at a time like this may sound like craziness. Um, the important thing is where the rhinos are coming from has, has also got challenges. I mean currently most of uh, the black rhino in Zimbabwe is on private land. Malalangwe next door has been extremely successful in looking after the rhino but they they also have just limited space, so they need to be able to offload some of those rhinos. Because let's face it, black rhino need space, elephant needs space, but at the same time, in the areas around these parks, global warming is going to be a massive, it's going to have a massive impact on people. The healthier the ecosystem is going to be, the more resilient it will be against future risks and future threats um, to both rhino and to human beings. So um, being able to look after rhino as a species is going to be critical for our own future. We obviously source animals from three different properties. They've got really good uh, tabs on their rhino population. Their scouts are out there every day. They know which individuals uh, are in which areas and uh, where they're likely to find them. And, and the trick here is that they're not very closely related because you, you're trying to preserve genetic diversity, but having friends around uh, and familiar faces and scents around is, is incredibly settling for them. A lot of the work that we've done previously, we've done a lot of rescues of entire populations. What we found from those releases is those animals reorganise themselves in exactly the same social orientation they had to each other from the area we gathered them. So it wasn't that they just wanted space and water, they wanted each other and they wanted specific each others. And so to now make them move is incredibly disruptive to them. So if they have a companion in that situation, it can just help make that whole process a lot less stressful and a lot more successful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, appreciate it. Good, this ball, we're going to 
to bring him down. Um, bring him towards you then. Uh, what's your position now, bro? So this is quite a large translocation. There's a lot of moving parts, a lot of rhinos involved. And anything can go wrong at, at any stage of the translocation. And we're, we're very aware of that. And that's why the Gun Review team has brought together people from all around the world, basically. We expect you to take care of them. To fit in and do their little bit of expertise, which is fantastic. So we'll typically try and get the dart in as quickly as possible. Generally, we dart the mother first and then immediately thereafter dart the calf. Okay, but put that in now, so we rush into where they are, so that we can work on them. The most important thing from uh, during the approach is uh, obviously to be conscious of, of the terrain. You don't want to be chasing animals too far, too hard, or, or of a difficult rocky terrain. Um, but at the same time, you need to maneuver them to a place that we can access uh, with, a, with a truck uh, for recovery purposes. Once the dart is in, the drugs that we're using are incredibly potent opioids um, and they have some really nasty side effects. So the most important one is a very profound depressing effect on the respiration system. So an animal's breathing will become a lot shallower um, and the breathing rate will be much decreased. Sometimes, you know, down to sort of four or five breaths a minute. Um, so you have to be super alert to that. Heat is a major, major problem. If an animal overheats during the chase or you've caught it on a really hot day, the drugs that we use also have a bit of a stimulatory effect on the muscles and can cause uh, sort of tremors and, and so forth and that can drive the heat up. And when you've got the combination of low oxygen and Acidic environment with heat, you can really damage muscles uh, permanently. Black rhino, although they're considered asocial animals or solitary animals, they're actually very social animals. It's just that they're very particular about who they socialize with. And family bonds are very strong, so you'll find most of the time they're seen with other members of their family. So you do have to, you can spend months planning your translocation and choosing the animals that you specifically want and that you think will give you the best outcome, both for your home population and for the new population. But when the time comes, there's invariably some unexpected curveball that will come your way and you need to adapt. What's the bang? Okay, it's on top. It's on top. Okay, BOMAS is the much pressure project we are doing from the beginning up to now. Some of the projects were fine, no pressure, but BOMAS, we have got big pressure because these rhinos, they need to get in in a few days. So we'll be working since 6 o'clock up to 5 o'clock every day. These rhinos, they were lastly seen in Gonarejo so far late. So we are happy about it because these rhinos are coming back to the show for the second time. My role is to manage the health and welfare of the rhinos as they recover from the translocation process. 
And that basically involves providing a calm and stress-free environment for them so they can transition and adjust to their new environment and particularly to any new browse species that they will incur in this new area. Black rhinos, although they're large and robust animals, they're quite complex and very sensitive. So basically you're bringing a wild animal, one plus one and a half ton animal into a small confined space. Um, so each animal and every animal in this translocation has reacted in their own way and adjusted in their own way. And you're bringing them into a confined space for a period of, of time. So it does take a fair bit of, I guess, finesse and subtle subtleties. It's basically, knowing what to tweak and, and when to tweak it, but it can make a huge difference. I'll probably do, what do you think, the, the little boy and the little girl, I want to do them together. Yeah, and then the mum the same night, or then next I, I, night? My, I, would, I would like to try and do the three of them. Just so managing rhinos in a boma is just as much about managing the people and the situation as it is the animals. The animals are going to do what they're going to do. Rhino behaviour is, is, is pretty set. Um, so managing the, the different facets of the people involved and what they need doing is, is just as important. So I'm basically the gatekeeper for the rhinos. So I try to alleviate any perceived stress that they may have. Sometimes, and that might be as simple as stopping a conversation that's too close to the bomers. It's not a, a big event for us, but it, it, it could be for, for the rhino. So there's a lot of patients involved. It's reacting to each individual rhino um, and what they need as an individual in that space. The Gonorrhea Reserve Conservation Trust is a partnership between the Frankfurt Zoological Society and Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Management Authority. It became possible through the strong relationship that we had with national parks at the time and still have. And uh, there's a lot of trust um, and a lot of communication in, form in forming this partnership. Because this park used to have rhino and they still very good habitat for rhino. There was no other reason why the rhino was not there except for human intervention and resources that were required. We just didn't have the resources to do the translocations. Therefore, the coming in of the Frankfurt Zoological Society to partner with us on this conservation endeavor, it has been really quite a significant and a decision that we look back and we smile and say, wow, that was really worth it. Wilderness areas are very rare on our planet and that was the reason why it was also so important to invest into the Gonorrhea Zoo wilderness area and the national park. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of our planet's surface is already heavily impacted by humans and that becomes uh, more and more every day. You know? So wilderness is rare and it's a prestigious resource. Zimbabwe is known for its wild places, its nature, its magic landscapes and its charismatic African megafauna. So Gonorrhea is a real asset to the country and as in other assets, one should use the interests and not the capital as such. Therefore, it is important to contain and maintain and protect and secure the Gonorrhea Zoo National Park. There's no results in conservation coming out without strong partnerships, strong relationships with local people, with donors, with between governments and NGOs. We've been involved with amazing people, whether it's from the communities, whether it's from Zimbabwe parks, whether it's from donors. And without that, we would not have been able to, to be able to do what we're doing.
mena nisuga malipat kuna kula kuna ndunda kuna soka na mtu nuno ni ne shungu le kwenye jamu renga soka kula ndunda na joina kumatiri waje renga 2014 lomu gonarezo soka kula huti raitamu ni kanti nyekela ni kani kondelela ndi la ndani promote yawa soka karenga three na karenga two ndi karenga one sisi sisi ni kama na ndrangela kum get training. Yeah, look at select the rangers. If you come out advertisement, come out local communities. Can you one month? Come here and give us. Eku one week. Come here, come here. 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 Wala vya kwa huo tisi huo tisi o, lo wapa sile kwa lao, huo vani vata kaka kwa vya gunarejo, mfuka vanya three months ta selection, lo vani tia three months ya kumwa wanyo vo, wangu tewe wanga kuti vo, wasuka lava kuta kwa wasala, huo vani vya kwa kutanja three months yeye chirenga, lo kosa wapa sile kwa kwa lao. Right. Yes, sir. 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 Kuna vanga sofi kama kwa. When the round of poaching started, uh, it took us all all by surprise. Uh, we were not actually prepared for it, so we had to actually learn from from scratch. Previously, although we were doing anti-poaching, uh, it was against an armed personnel, whereas uh, the cross-border poaching that involved people with, uh, with military background who would actually shoot back. So it was actually a challenge to actually get everyone trained and uh, motivated to actually face this new role. So that's made uh, a significant change. Gunarejo National Parks ina marenga 215 kasiyesi le sukombesa eguti ya sukombesa tirisa na wakati ke gunarejo ina marenga wala wala 215 ya kutoa kava ndao ikuwa ya kutoa kumba kumba ndao ikuwa saka aitem bokuna ndao kutoa kena moon afamba inga mukumbos ndao ikuwa itele marenga lawa ngati tini mesela lawa tsakela kutiro lawa angane chivindi lawa angane shungu yote ratero wa gunarejo. It's debatable uh, whether national parks of this nature should be self-sustainable, because self-sustainable is often seen as a financial uh, end goal. And I think in our case, the self-sustainability is, is not so much just finance. So we are looking at uh, self-sustainability in a sense of um, also the, the way that we work with our communities around us, that they feel that the park is not just a threat to them and it is not just an alien area or an area that has been taken away from them, but it is an area that they have access to and that we work very closely with them. When we reintroduced uh, black rhinos, we considered uh, the community as a key pillar in conservation. So we do have uh, a number of uh, programs where we involve uh, the community in a phase of the park. We engage the community, try to you know, identify the key issues and collectively 
action, those uh, key issues as partners. What we've been doing today is um, we involved the Chipinda primary students uh, to compete in naming one of the rhinos that has been allocated for school children to name. And they've given us a number of uh, names. And today, that was the final day where we involved them once again to select the best name. So they were uh, kind of uh, voting and selecting the best name. So, you know, in a way, you know, rhinos is almost like a dinosaur. You know, they, you know, you feel, you know, there's certainly a feeling that if we are not going to step up in the way we're looking after, we are going to lose it. That is going to be the next dodo. And unless we are going to get communities to take ownership, unless we are ourselves going to take more ownership, um, and you know, we're going to lose rhino in our lifetime. And I, for one, don't want to show you know, my grandchildren a rhino in a picture. Hey guys, are you coming over? One last feed. One last feed. Quick, quick. Probably not. Okay, so game day today. Um, the culmination of almost three weeks for these guys in the Boma. So the little calf that caused us so much Sleepless Nights, the first week or so, has turned out to be an absolute little star and his older sister is just one of the sweetest rhinos I've ever encountered. Hey darling. And it's kind of poignant that they're gonna be the first ones out with their mother in about an hour's time. Over the last few days, we've been preparing the ground, um, getting them familiar with each other's scent of dung in, in adjacent pens, um, and distributing the dung along a trail, uh, leading them hopefully to water. Yeah, so we've, we've laid the groundwork and we've done the, the best we can to, to ensure that it goes as smoothly as possible. Uh, but you know, anything can happen. So what we're looking for today is something, a very quiet release. We don't want people around. Once they've finished eating and are, are settling down after their, their afternoon meal, um, we'll open quietly and, and just let them out. For me to see rhino, particularly black rhino, going back into Gunnar is, uh, is a humbling experience. Uh, it really is. Um, I was very close to them during that period that they were introduced through to their final extinction in 91. And the gap of 30 years now to see them being reintroduced and uh, the opportunity to witness 
uh, seeing them back on Conorajor soil to me was one of those um, experiences that will go down in my history as being something very special, very unique.